What a fucking opening that was, eh? It's the most exciting, I can't breathe. Showbiz. Two blokes with, with shirts and ties in the front row. Birmingham Social Security? No. Yes. No. Great. What a week I've had. I had a phone call, when would it be? Wednesday. And this, this woman's voice came on. I said, hello. She said, is that Frank Skinner? I said, it is. She said, look, you don't know me. I'm sorry to bother you, but I, I just wanted to listen to your voice whilst masturbating. <laughs> I said, that's amazing. How did you know I was masturbating? <laughs> she said it was just a shot in the dark. I laughed. I come from Birmingham, some of you may know. And this, that, thanks. And there's a sort of a knee jerk. A bloke in the front row there went, whoa. And are you from Birmingham? Warsaw. Warsaw. Quite posh, really. It is quite posh. Warsaw's the sort of place they get out the bath to have a piss, right? <laughs> now, I'm from West Bromwich. We don't get out the bath to have a shit, right? <laughs> We don't get in the fucking bath most of the time, it doesn't bother us. Now we have, we've got an art centre in Birmingham, you know, you, know, you don't have to come to London, you know, to be fancy. We've got, a, we've got an art centre. No, we have. We've got an art centre called The Triangle. Have you ever been there, mate? Where is it? It's in Birmingham. Somebody cheered, so it exists. Yes, it is in Aston. Yes, it's a lovely area, isn't it? It's not, especially nice in the autumn, I always think. So I think if you're going to have the shit kicked out of you, it's nice to have some leaves to lie on, isn't it? <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, this, this place, it's called, this art centre is called The Triangle, right? Which is, even if you go and see a crap film there, at least you can do a pubic hair joke with your mates the next day, eh? Say, so I was in The Triangle last night. Uh... <laughs> now, uh... <laughs> They're the sort of, uh... It's the sort of place that shows nine and a half hour documentaries in Russian about snow and stuff like that. <laughs> Dreadful. So there's lots of people walking around with little wire glasses on. Use it with the top two inches of a penguin novel stitched into their jacket pocket, right? <laughs> Intellectual. And they all go there, and it's, it's not like going to an ordinary cinema. You know, for a start off, if you've, have you been to the Triangle? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you go in there, right, over the entrance into the cinema, there's a sign that says, absolutely no smoking, right? And I thought to myself, why the fuck? Does it say, absolutely no smoking? Did it used to say, no smoking? And people thought, oh, well, you probably have a bit of a smoke then. <laughs> probably smoke half of one and then nub it, you know. <laughs> Next time you go in, I'll say, I fucking told you, no fucking smoke. Anyway, I went there and uh, they had a David Lynch season on. I don't know if you know, if you know David Lynch. He used to uh, be a big mate of Jimmy Tarbucks in the 60s. <laughs> That was Kenny Lynch, you're right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, David Lynch, he made Twin Peaks, right? And um, which Jimmy Tarbot wasn't in, unfortunately, but he would have been brilliant, wouldn't he? Previously in Twin Peaks. Ho oh, oh. ho! <laughs> I'd have watched it, right? But the thing is with these little independent, arty, farty, mm, cinemas, is when you get to an ordinary cinema, you're sitting there, you know, and you watch the film and all this, and you get the lads sitting at the back. You know the lads that throw peanuts at people when they come in? There's a special method to throwing peanuts in a cinema. You do it like this. Fuck it. <laughs> Every obvious victim that comes in, people in body warmers, for example, right? <laughs> you know you're not going to have any hassle with. You can absolutely blast them with peanuts. I saw one poor couple, and they were sitting in the front row, and they were in a shower of peanuts. <laughs> and the woman was going, Tristram? <laughs> Go and tell those lads at the back. And he said, just leave, just leave it, will you? Look, do you want a choc ice? Here, have this one. <laughs> I felt sorry for him, I'll be honest. Anyway, this David Lynch season, they had uh, The Elephant Man was on, right? Now, I don't know uh, if you've... Uh, yeah, David Lynch made The Elephant Man, right? He didn't make The Elephant Man, he made the film The Elephant Man. If he'd made The Elephant Man, it was a bit of a botched job, really, wasn't it? Big lump, I'd have played that straight off. Anyway, I saw that film, and they say, you know, that they say that art can't change your life, don't they? You often hear this if you're out in Clapham one night. One of the lads in the pub will say, Art, 
Fucking hot, you'll see. <laughs> the old jam top, hot. It can't change the old bread knife, right? <laughs> but it can. It can. I saw that film, The Elephant Man. It changed my life profoundly. That means a lot, right? right? It changed my life profoundly, right, in two different ways. First of all, it made me realise that you could be ugly and repulsive on the outside, but inside you can be very beautiful and sensitive. Good news for the social security lads, I would have thought. <laughs> so it was a joke. Secondly, I watched that film, it put me off cauliflower for life. I can't... <laughs> I can't look at one now. It, oh. But it's very moving. Uh, have, you, have you seen? Have you seen, you've seen the Elephant Man film? It is very moving. There's, there's, Anthony Hopkins is in it. Doesn't eat anybody. No muscle. Fuck all. It's quite nice in it, right? He plays a doctor, but a, a nice doctor. And there's a scene when he calls the Elephant Man into his office, and he says, uh, "Ellie." Come in. <laughs> so he knew him quite well by this stage. He says, "Ellie, come in." He said, "I oh, know. I've been meaning to have a, a, a bit of a, a chat. Take that fucking bag off when I'm talking to you." <laughs> he said, "I've been meaning to have a. Did you do that shit?" Never mind. He said, I want you to know, Ellie, that there'll always be a room for you here at the hospital. Now, this was very... This is a bloke who'd been kicked around all his life, and it showed, right? He had a good big lump. <laughs> and suddenly, someone had showed him a bit of kindness, eh? a bit of friendliness. An elephant man, he turned around, I'll never forget, he looked and he got, he got a bit of a tear. And I'll always remember, he turned to Anthony Hopkins and he said, Ah! It was really moving. <laughs> I cried, I'll be honest with you. Which is ironic, right, because uh, my mum, right, she really likes these sad films, you know, she... Have you ever seen Beaches? Have you ever seen that film? Sad. Sad. Fucking sad. It is, right? When I watched it with me mum, she was crying, crying her eyes out. I said, Mum, fuck off, right? Because we're a close family. And she said, no, you could... Because she's Leonard Rossiter, my mother. She said, no. <laughs> she said, my God. No, she didn't say that at all. <laughs> and then my dad came in and said, oh, Why aren't you, Frank? <laughs> because I live in the crazy world of British sitcom. <laughs> no, I don't, really. She said to me, she said, oh, she says, you can take the piss out of me, Frank. I said, we've got a machine for that, Mum. She said, never mind that. She said, you can take the piss out of me, but you'll find, as you get older, you can judge how good a film is by the amount of tissues you get through while you're watching it. <laughs> no need for a punchline there, then, I don't think. <laughs> oh, dear. I don't want to go back to that subject. It's a little bit sordid, but I must tell you, I, I grew up... Um, how old are you, the man from Warsaw? What's your name? Mark. How old are you, Mark? I don't think you are, right? You look very baby-faced, don't you, Mark? You can tell me, I'm not selling fireworks. I mean, you look about, if you don't mind me saying, about 15, right? You look, you've got that look to me that you've, you've been out building dens all day. <laughs> One day, eh? <laughs> eh? Grows on your bollocks as well, you know? <laughs> it does. This could be on your bollocks. Well, not this, obviously, but... Well, this, I don't care. Well, I'll tell you something, Mark. I grew up in the 70s, right? Which you've probably done in history, right? <laughs> and I had one particular fantasy. I really fancied, I really fancied, right? The blonde one in ABBA, right? <laughs> I don't remember his name, but fuck him. <laughs> I would have, I really would have. But Mark, I'll guess, he's a bit of a Turtles fan. I'm right, aren't I? <laughs> I think you've got the fucking pyjamas and everything, haven't you? It's, it's a good story, though, isn't it? No, it is. It's all about this one-eared Chinese rat, right? And he's owned by a ninja, right? You know what a ninja is, a martial... Martial arts, right? You must have come across it at the Social Security when people are throwing themselves at the perspex. <laughs> well, He's owned by this ninja, and the rat watches the ninja practice his martial arts, and the rat starts to pick up the, the moves, right? Could happen. <laughs> Don't spoil it for Mark. He believes. <laughs> Let him believe while he's young, right? 
So this rat, he picks up these skills and he's fucking good, right? So he thinks, right, I'm going to teach these skills to other creatures, right? Because he looks in the mirror, he's got big yellow teeth, bad breath, greasy, horrible whiskers, red eyes. He thinks, well, teaching, obviously, right? <laughs> That'll be all around the playground in September. <laughs> oh, I thought I'd picked up a bit of hostility. Have we got any teachers in tonight? I always fancy being a primary school teacher myself because um, that's the fucking job, isn't it? They turn up in September and uh, they say to the kids, right, um, morning class, there's the sandpit, I'll see you at the Christmas party. <laughs> now, that's a job, isn't it? Are you in the union? Are you in the teachers' union? Are you? Are you a bit of a... Oh, fuck. I saw the, uh, the teachers' union meeting on the, uh, on the telly this, this year, and it was great. There was this bit where these teachers stood up, right? And they got all the, the, the leaders of the teachers' union was on the platform, and this bloke stood up and he went, excuse me. <laughs> you know when teachers get angry, they're a bit frightening, aren't they? Mark's a bit scared down there. <laughs> he went, excuse me, I'd just like to say, he said, that, that, that we, the ordinary rank and file teachers, are sick of being patronised by the leadership of this union. And the leader of the teachers' union, he stood up, looked at this bloke, and he said, are you chewing? <laughs> get out. Get out. When I was a kid, I went to school in West Bromwich, right? And, um, because I live there, and it seemed like a good idea, so I've done bus fare, right? And we used to have this stuff called Izel toilet paper. Have you heard of this? <laughs> oh, fucking hell. <laughs> this was where Willie Whitelaw got the idea for the short, sharp shock from, right? <laughs> if, you, if you've never tried it, imagine wiping your ass on half a milk bottle. <laughs> and you've got a... It's, it's wicked stuff, right? And we were told we had to use it for economic reasons because you could use it for tracing as well, right? <laughs> so obviously we grew to hate this stuff. And what we used to do, we used to go into the toilet and take it off the roll and throw it around the toilet, right? And it was, it was, it was a sort of a cultural outing for us, right? <laughs> Close as we ever got, right? But of course they put a stop to this. We had a really horrible teacher called Mr Ward, right? And what Mr Ward did, right, was he kept the toilet roll and kept it in his desk, right? And this is, I swear to you, this is true. You used to have to say to him, uh, so can I go to the toilet, please, Mr Ward? And he'd say, do you want to use paper? <laughs> and all your mates are going, <laughs> And he'd say, do you want to use paper? And he'd say, well, what, what else you got? I, I don't know. <laughs> In an ideal world, I'd like to use your fucking pipe, Mr Ward. <laughs> Didn't actually say that, obviously. <laughs> so this, I swear, honestly, this is totally true. If you said, yes, I want to use paper, please, sir, then uh, he used to say, how many sheets? <laughs> it's true, and kids used to say, um, what, nine, ten? <laughs> Make it twelve, let's save on a bit of laundry, shall we? <laughs> and he used to count them out, one at a time, honestly, and he used to take the sheets and he used to have to walk out the room like this. With his... And I used to dream of the day when that door would swing open. There'd be a kid there with his trousers around his ankles saying, 15, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, this rat, right, I haven't forgotten, Mark. This one-eared Chinese rat, right, he goes down the sewer looking for pupils, right, because obviously even with ninja skills you don't want to go in a modern-day comprehensive unless you absolutely fucking have to, right? <laughs> so picture a one-eared rat wading through the sewer. What does he find? We know. Four turtles, right, covered in shit, right? It's a sewer, obviously, right? So what do you do if you find four turtles covered in shit? You think, oh... I'll name these after Renaissance painters. <laughs> Obvious, really, isn't it? So then there's five in the gang, right? A rat and four turtles. He's the only one who isn't named after a famous artist. And he's got one ear. <laughs> Missed a bit of a chance there, I think. <laughs> Don't pretend you got that, Mark, because you did. The other advice that he gives these, he, he tells them to wear masks, right? <clears throat> now, Batman wears a mask, right? So he can take the mask off, go in the pub, and the barman will say, Sir, what do you think of this Batman? And he can say, Oh, he's a wank, yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows, right? But if you're an eight foot turtle <laughs> on your way into a pub, right? 
It doesn't make much fucking difference, really. <laughs> kind of an eight-foot turtle going to go in a pump and go, whoop, fucking hell. Nearly went in with me mask on. <laughs> then I'd have been recognised, for sure. <laughs> he walks in like this with a big shell, <laughs> and all the locals are going, can you use another shit, or is it... <laughs> is it me? <laughs> yeah. I was... Um, have a good laugh, mate. Why, why fight it? I was up in Edinburgh um, <clears throat> last year, and uh, it was, it was, I had a good time. I think there's all sorts of people go to Edinburgh. And uh, one of the people there, which you might not know about, was Rolf Harris was up there. Yes. He was signing books and stuff. <clears throat> and you probably wouldn't remember Rolf, Mark. He, he caused a big sensation in the 60s with two little boys. <laughs> but, uh, it was all hushed up, obviously. <laughs> and his catchphrase was, tie me kangaroo down, right? And it is the only way to fuck them. Trust me. <laughs> no, it is, really, because those are knockout drops. They keep them still, but there's no response. You know, you feel like you're, you feel like you're taking something that isn't being freely given, and it's, it cheapens it for me. Now, Rolf, to my surprise, is not in Prisoner Cell Block 8, right? And now, <laughs> I've never worked out why, because the one thing I've learned from prison and cell block is if they ever bring hanging back in Australia, they better get some strong fucking rope, right? Because there's nobody under 26 stone in prison in Australia. But I thought, why is it Rolf in this? Because Rolf would be the absolute perfect solitary confinement prisoner, wouldn't he? He'd be great. He would, because Rolf, all he needs is a nice big sheet of paper and a thick felt pen. <laughs> He's the happiest fucker on earth, right? <laughs> Have you seen him on Cartoon Time when he's saying, uh, so we'll just draw in the little... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just shade in a bit of a... Just blow a bit of a... <laughs> 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 and you're watching it and you're thinking, Rolf, Rolf, if you're going to use those thick felt pens, don't inhale them, mate. <laughs> of course, I was... Uh, when I grew up, one of the, the only Australian programmes on the telly when I was, was a small child was a thing called Skippy. Do you remember that? What a fuck of a great programme that was. Oh, somebody did going to do the theme tune there. Was it? It sounded more like the Clangers, but we'll stick with it. I think I can, I'll just adjust my equipment. And now Skippy, right? Skippy was a little bush kangaroo, and he was owned, right, by this lad called Sonny. Right, he was a little fat kid with bad skin who I think grew up to become Clive James. <laughs> or was that Skippy? Anyway, it always start, every episode started the same. Sonny would come down the rancho steps, which is a fucking good trick if you can do it, right? <laughs> yeah, some of us will be trying in the morning, I think. Come down the rancho steps, and Skippy would come bounding in, and Skippy would always, it was always like this. Because <laughs> there was no decaffeinated coffee in those days. He was a terrible wreck, skip it. And he'd, go, and he'd look at Sonny and he'd always go. <laughs> and Sonny would say, What's that, skip? <laughs> Helicopter crash? <laughs> Forty-seven miles northwest of Bongaloo, <laughs> and you know, even as a small boy, I used to think bollocks. <laughs> For a start off, I don't think a kangaroo could give a shit if there was a helicopter crash. I mean, what does their life consist of? Eating and jumping. That's it, isn't it? <laughs> Not a bad life when you put it like that, is it? No, I reckon, I reckon Skippy was saying kangarooey type things like, um, "Could I have some leaves, please?" <laughs> Um, could I have some leaves, please? Sonny. <laughs> What's that skip? <sighs> oh, <dear. laughs> I said, could I have some leaves, please? Helicopter crash? <laughs> Where? 47 miles northwest of Bongaloo. What the fucking hell are you talking about? 
Now, I was doing this bit in, in a pub in, in Deptford, which some of you might may know Deptford. Lovely place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, you're from Birmingham, you're from Deptford. You're from the world, aren't you? It's, it's, uh, the, uh, the pub I played, I, uh, I got a bit suspicious about it because there was a, an area marked out for ambulances on the car park and I thought, it sounded a little bit unnerving. And I went on and I was talking about skipping. I said he has an Australian program, I love when I was a kid. And there was this bloke at the back, he's a big lad. And he went, yeah, mate. It was fucking flipper. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 flipper was a dolphin. Excuse me, I mean, Skippy was it? Skippy. He says, look, mate, it was fucking flipper. And he was a big lad, like he got a, he got a face like a bulldog li licking piss off a nettle, right? <laughs> So I got scared, I got fucking frightened, I'll be quite honest with you. And I, I thought all I can do is to do the whole routine, right, with Flipper instead of Skippy. <laughs> so I had Sonny come down the Rancho steps again, right, which is, I know he's, but when you're young you can do it twice in five minutes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ooh, what's that strange wheezing, slithering noise? <laughs> oh, it's you, Flip. They fucking hate that, you know. They hate that. <laughs> What's that flip? <laughs> Submarine crash? <laughs> of course, the fucking thing was dead by the time I got to the leaves joke. That's the end of that. The thing I liked when I was a kid was those uh, Kung Fu films. Oh, oh yeah. <clears throat> they were great. Well, oh, I love them. Enter the Dragon, eh? They'll fuck anything over there, you know. <laughs> but I really got into Kung Fu, right? And I had one of these Kung Fu stars. I don't know if you remember these, right? Razor Sharp. No. Razor Sharp. Don't do it, thank you. Razor Sharp. Star shaped pieces of metal, and you skim them at stuff, right? And they were fucking lethal, right? And I used to go over the park practicing. I had a really nice one. It was all engraved with Chinese writing, right? And a fucking dog ran off with it, right? I mean, it was in his back. But even so, it was an accident. No, I was going for the head and it swerved at the last minute. Oh, I've upset you now. No, I, I like dogs. Don't get them wrong. I've, I've, got, I've got a dog, in fact. I, I, I had a bit of trouble with him, in fact, because uh, he's got this habit. Have you? Anyone got a dog here? Is it? Not, not here now, obviously. <laughs> He's got a habit of pulling himself round the yard on his arse. Have you seen him do it? <laughs> Still watch him on the yard going. <laughs> I watched him for hours, right? Because I used to like Ironside. Good program. <laughs> Very similar effect, really. And I couldn't work out why he was doing it, right? And then one afternoon, I was up in my bedroom, right? And I was just holding the curtain open with, with my free hand, right? And I could see him down on the yard below, right, pulling himself round on his arse. And he'd written. <laughs> in three different colours, in fact. I think. The next door neighbour is shagging me. Well, I was absolutely astonished. I was, because the next door neighbour is such a quiet bloke, you'd never suspect in a million years, you know. And I mean, anybody could do it once after a few drinks, obviously. <laughs> I imagine, right? But well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this story, and I'll share this with you because I feel we know each other now, don't we, right? What happened? I was going out with this this woman, right? And I was absolutely in love. I was besotted, right? Really was. And we had something electric, you know. Well, some of the stuff we used was electric, right? <laughs> and I felt I loved her that much that just saying her name over and over to myself used to arouse me, right? The fact that her name was Throbbing Volva probably got something to do with it. She was Polish, obviously. So one day we were out strolling through the park and I said, you know, Throb, wouldn't it be great to have sex here in the open air? Nobody about. 
And she said, Let, let's do it. Let's bloody do it. We did it and it was, it was fantastic. It was, it was like a spiritual uplifting thing, right? Until this Alsatian started licking the arse. <laughs> Yes. Well, I, I said, fuck off, I'm having an exciting sexual experience here. And my girlfriend fucked off. And I stayed for about half an hour, it was all right. I mean, I'd have been there all afternoon, but eventually his owner said, well, come on, Rex, you've had enough of that now. Come off. But the bloke next door, you would never have suspected in a million years. He was a quiet, sweet bloke, you know. And it made me think, you know, when you get these mass murderers, right, and they kill 15 people and eat 12 and put two in the fridge and all this stuff, right, they always interview the neighbours and the neighbours stand outside the house and the neighbours always go, well, he was such a quiet man, you know. <laughs> Kept himself to himself, did a bit of gardening, you know. Sometimes we'd hear him digging at three or four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> there was a bloke... This is true, in the northeast of England, right, and he went on a shotgun rampage. I don't know if you saw this, right? And he was blasting away at people. Dreadful, right? No, not funny. Not a funny bit, that, mate. He was blasting away. And it said in the newspaper report, honestly, this is true, it said, a man went past on a push bike, right, and called out, hey, don't be so bloody stupid. <laughs> no, pick the scene, right? There's a bloke with a, with a shotgun smouldering at the end with a face like this. There's bits of people on the fucking pavement. Who do you think was being stupid in this story? I suppose the bloke thought, well, you know, I'm on a push bike. If there's any trouble, I'm out of here. It's probably a rally chopper, you know. So he fancied his chances. Hey, don't be so bloody... Oh. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> Nearly got run over then. Oh dear, oh dear. I, um, I haven't been very well actually. Does it show? Yes. It does. I went to the doctors and he prescribed um, suppositories, right, which is medication you stick up your arse, right. And it is. I don't know how else to put it, or where else for that matter, but I got, I got the box from the chemist, and it said on the box, place the suppository four inches up the rectum. <laughs> Keep out of the reach of children. <laughs> well, I thought four inches should do it, surely, you know. I, mean, I could wear high heels as an added precaution, obviously. <laughs> well, I have to be careful, because many of you will have already guessed, I am essentially a children's entertainer. I do... Uh, I do kids' parties and stuff with this material, they fucking love it, right? And uh, I don't call myself Frank Skinner, I call myself Badum Badum the Clown. It's a good title, isn't it? And I chose that name because kids make that noise, don't they? Badum Badum. Well, you've obviously never run one over, but they do, right? <laughs> don't clap, don't you all hate yourselves tomorrow. One thing I never do, I never give these children alcohol because I think it is morally wrong to give small children alcohol, right, on top of all that dope. But when they've had a smoke, we laugh. Fuck it. We had this party the other week, right, this kid, right, he got up and he, 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 he's on his tenth bowl of trifle. You know when you've had a smoke, you'll fucking eat anything, right? And his paper hat was over here somewhere, it's all over the place. And he stopped the party and he tried to tell us that the saxophone solo on the end of Walk on the Wild Side isn't a saxophone solo at all. In fact, it's Sweep telling children to worship the devil. <laughs> well, it scared the shit out of me, I'm telling you. Ruined the fucking party, right? And I couldn't really argue with him. I don't know much about, uh, about modern music. I, I did them. Uh, do you know a band called The The? Have you heard of them? Yeah. Are they any good? Really? They, they make a very nice t-shirt. They do. No, they do. I've never heard anything, but, but I saw this t-shirt and I've got a friend with a birthday coming up and I thought I'd buy him this t-shirt, right? So I gave him the, the, the t-shirt, right? I gave it him. He went fucking mad. He went fucking... And it's funny because when he gets angry, his stutter gets even worse. So, you know, we laugh. I'm, uh, I, I like the old rock and roll music. I, I'm a bit of an Elvis fan, I'll be honest. I love fuck. Oh, I love Elvis. Yes. I read a book about him, you know. Apparently in the 50s, he used to go on stage, right, with a length of hose pipe down his trousers. So when he went... 
looked like he'd got glandular trouble, right? <laughs> so when I started going on stage, I thought, I'll fucking try this. And I did, I got the old hose pop. Now, if you ever try this, Mark, which you might, you never know, make sure you get all the water out the hose pipe. <laughs> Otherwise, the effect is not very sexy at all, really, and a little bit embarrassing, right? <laughs> Another thing about Elvis, <clears throat> I cried the night that he died, but I saw it coming, right? Because he used to eat 28 cheeseburgers a day. Greedy. <laughs> and they reckon that when he, was, when he died, they lay him in state in Memphis, not in a coffin, but on a big fucking bap, right? <laughs> And the mourners went past, was just sprinkling onions. I, 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 I loved him. He was great. There's a shot, right, of Chuck Berry putting a dill pickle down on Elvis. It's one of the saddest things I've ever fucking seen. The saddest thing for me, I think, is that he, ne you know, he never came to England. I mean, what a tragedy that was. Never played over here. Apparently, he nearly came over here in 1976, but there was a hosepipe ban and uh, they were never there. <laughs> I must tell you this, I got invited to a party, right, a few weeks ago. Now, I hadn't been to a party, right, since I was 17 years old, right? Probably the sort of parties you go to now, Mark. And I thought this party would be just the same. So I turned up, as I always did at that, in those days. I shook hands with the hostess, thanked her for inviting me, went upstairs, had a piss in her bed. I <laughs> broke some things, stole some other things, went downstairs, I had a shit on the lawn, told the next door neighbour to fuck off, walked home on my own, and then claimed I'd been shagging all night, right? It was a... <laughs> It was a standard, and Mark's saying, well, there's nothing unusual about that, oh, so what? It was, it was a, a very strange party indeed, I must say. But I, I, had, I had a good time, you know, and I even took, now this might jog the memory of some people, I even took a party seven. <laughs> Do you remember these? Seven pints of bitter in one can, and you've never tasted anything like it in your fucking life. And it, it, was, it had a magical quality, because you could take a party seven, you could take it to the South Pole, leave it on the ice, go away for six months, go back, open that can, and that beer would still be at body temperature. <laughs> it was incredible. I'll, I'll give you an example. There was me and a load of other lads, all about your age, Mark, and we were on our way. There about 15 of us on our way to a party. We was in, in, in a Vauxhall Viva, as I recall. And the car broke down. It was a freezing cold night, and we got a bit scared. Oh, we were, we were frightened, right? It was so cold. You could have grated cheese on my scrotum. It was that cold. <laughs> it was so cold, a couple of lads took their asses in out the windows. That's how cold it was. <laughs> and for a teenage lad, that is a major wrench, isn't it? Because that's the only reason you passed your fucking test in the first place. So you can get that ass out the car window. I remember passing my test, I had the pass certificate in one hand, I was already unbuckling my trousers. <laughs> and I drove home with it out the driver's side, like this. <laughs> if ever the police stopped us, we used to say our indicators are broken, you could get away with it. <laughs> they do say, you know, I don't know if this is true, but they reckon that the reason they sent so many teenage lads to the Gulf War was that the theory was, if teenage lads fly an aeroplane, anything like they drive a fucking car, nobody could stop them, right? <laughs> One Iraqi pilot reckoned that a British plane pulled up alongside him and there was about 12 lads crammed into one cockpit. <laughs> going, fuck up, you fucking A woman from Baghdad said that during an air raid, a British plane wound down the window and somebody shouted, get your yashmak off. <laughs> now, I know that's politically unsound, but I suppose the women of Baghdad are going to have to get used to that because there's going to be a few fucking building sites there now, I would have thought. <laughs> the most amazing fact for me, I'll move on there and we'll see what happens. The most amazing fact for me is the fact that the British sent Jim Bowen to entertain the troops. <laughs> and still won. Now that is, that's phenomenal. Imagine being in camp the night that Jim Bowen's concert was on. And everybody's going, well, I'll actually, I'll go on an air raid tonight. No, me, I'll go. No, like me go. But you're one of the cleaners, aren't you? Well, I'll go anyway. I don't need a plane. Give us a bomb, I'll fucking walk. <laughs> Thank you.
Because if you lose a war, it must be a bit of a blow anyway, but if you lose a war and you've got Jim Bowen with you, that is the end of the fucking world, right? Because you're sitting there thinking, oh no, this is terrible. And there's Jim Bowen going, oh dear, lads. Let's see what you would have won, come on. <laughs> wouldn't help, would it at all? Really wouldn't help. Anyway, as it was this night, we were trapped in this freezing cold cart. What we did, we used our wits. We all huddled round this party seven, right? <laughs> and I think the warmth from that saved our fucking lives that night. Anyway, I was at this party, I was having a good time. I was grinding away, you know, because they had a lathe and stuff there. <laughs> and suddenly, in the corner, I saw this remarkable sight, I tell you, and I thought, oh my goodness, I saw the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. And I got a bit, I got a bit jumpy, I'll be honest. Do you believe in love at first sight? It's your only fucking hope. Let's face it. It's a joke. It's a joke. I looked at this woman and something leapt inside me, you know. I said, fuck off, mate. I'm going to have a word with this woman. So, and I started moving towards her, right, and oh dear, and she was, oh, I got a bit scared, because you know, when, when you approach somebody for the first time, some people have got these set chat-up lines, but you never know, do you? And sometimes people can look fantastic from a distance, when you get close, they're not so nice, are they? Sometimes they've got very bad breath, right? And you have to try and bring it into the conversation, say stuff like, uh, so, do you eat a lot of shit, or? <laughs> and it doesn't always go down that well, you know. So I'm walking across towards her, and I'm getting a bit edgy. I'm thinking, what the fuck am I going to say? You know, I was, I was getting nervous. And then I remembered that I saw this thing. Bill Wyman had written this article in a magazine, right? And it was called How to Chat Up Women. Now I thought, isn't it sad that in 1992, a bloke would write an article called How to Chat Up Women? It's pathetic, right? But I read it, like, just in case, right? <laughs> Now, Bill Wyman's argument is this. He says what you should do is use your weakness as your strength, right? So Bill Wyman, he's, apparently he's a bit short, right? So what he does, he goes up to the tallest woman in the place and says, uh, excuse me, uh, now, you're probably thinking, you know, about going to bed with me tonight, but, you know, I don't sleep with women who are taller than me, right? And he reckons that these women then try and talk him into bed and say, no, no, it'll work, okay. And they talk him and they take him home. <laughs> Doesn't fucking work. I tried it, right? I tried it. Now, it didn't, I couldn't use the short thing because I'm not all that short, but I am quite thin. I'm sort of built like a gypsy's dog, really, you know, all, <laughs> all dick and bones, right? <laughs> so I thought, use your weakness as your strength. I walked up to a woman at a party and I said, look, I don't normally sleep with fat fuckers, but it didn't work. <laughs> For some reason, it just, it just didn't work. Well, the thing about Bill Wyman, apparently, he's, he's a phenomenal keeper of records and, and bits of uh, memorabilia, you know, and, and all this trivial stuff. And he keeps all the tickets of old Stones gigs and stuff. And one of the things, he keeps a book, right? And he writes down what people say when they orgasm, right? Now, I, I don't know how you spell, <laughs> but it's all in there, right? <laughs> And I thought, this is a fuck of a good idea. So I now keep a book of what people say when I orgasm, right? <laughs> My own personal favourite is, will you be quiet? I'm trying to watch the film. That one seems to go down quite well. My main problem in, in cases like this, of t talking to people for the first time like this, is that I'm frightened of rejection, terrified. When I was a, a youth and I used to go to discos, and you know, you sort of see the girls would be over there and you'd sort of think, oh, I'll go and ask for a dance. I was terrified in case they said no. So I'd go over and say, uh, with me flares sort of flapping about, right? I'd say, uh, do, you, uh, do you want to dance? And if they said no, I'd say, well, what the fucking are you doing here then? It's a fucking disco! <laughs> if I saw them dancing later on, I'd go over and say, ah, you said you didn't want to fucking dance. Oh, don't, don't push me, mate. Come on, I'll take the pair of you on. It was pathetic. <laughs> it was absolutely pathetic. And usually I don't have the guts to ask at all. I admire women like, for, for months and I'm too frightened to say anything. There was this barmaid who I was, oh, I, couldn't, I couldn't sleep, right? Erica, her name was. Erica Swallows, right? <laughs> Although why she'd written it in the men's toilets is beyond me. <laughs> and for months I, I hankered after this woman and I never had the guts, right, to ask her. And then one night, I had a few drinks, right? And it's a great icebreaker, isn't it? <laughs> eh? So I went up and I said, Erica. 
I have the slow blink, guys. I said, I fucking love you. I fucking love you. Nissan Domo. I thought it's going well. I knew inside. I even leant over the bar and I snatched a kiss. I did, because it, it was a bit of a trick I used to use. They used to call me Frank the Kiss Snatcher, right? I think I've got that the right way around, anyway. <laughs> Eventually, I said, I summoned up the courage. I said, Erica, I said, I've, uh, you're a fantastic woman. Why don't you come back with me tonight? We can make wonderful love together. And she smiled and she said, well, I'll be putting the towels on in 10 minutes. I said, well, next week then. It's all right. <laughs> I've gone too far. I have. I'm terribly sorry. I said to myself, when I got here tonight, I said, Frank, it's a fuck. Frank, I said, because I'm a bit deaf. Frank, I said, it's a fucking theatre, you know, keep the party clean, family audience. But I can't help it. It's like there's a little man inside me, you know. Not every night, but uh, <laughs> maybe tonight, eh? <laughs> so. Anyway, I was still making my way towards this woman. I eventually arrived there and we started chatting. I was quite natural. She was fantastic. She was witty, she was articulate, and we had a real good laugh. And oh, I was falling in love, right? There was just one thing, right? You know, no matter, even if you look like me and you're a bit of a wreck, you always look for perfection in others. And she just had just one thing. She just had a mole on her chin, right? But there was a hair growing out of that mole that was four inches fucking long, right? She had this hair, and I don't mean like a little silver, whispery, fluffy, woofy, you can hardly fucking see hair. This would have been at home on a double base, right? <laughs> I actually thought for a joke, maybe, I could walk up to her and go, do 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 <laughs> But I didn't. And I'll tell you why I didn't, because I think you should always put other people's feelings first, don't you? I think that's, I think that's so important in life, you know? I can be up here and be a bit common and a bit crude, but I'd like to think there's a moral to this act, and it is. Always put other people's feelings first. And I'll give you an example, a sort of a, a moral tale, a parable, right? Now, afterwards, you might say to me, Frank, that was a bit fucking crude, wasn't it? But trust me, there is a moral to this, right? On the occasions... This is a sensitive subject, but I'm going to go carefully. On the occasions that I've been fortunate enough to be asked by a woman to perform oral sex, right? You could hear a fucking pin drop, couldn't you? <laughs> On the occasions I've been asked to perform oral sex, sometimes when you go down there, right? Stay with me. When you go down there, there's just a little, not, not much, but just, just, a little, just a little bit of toilet paper, right? Nothing. <laughs> not a lot. Just like a sort of cloakroom ticket tucked behind a lapel. <laughs> now, what you must never do, you must never go, for fox, I have a look at this. Never, never do that. Always put other people's feelings first, right? I eat it. I fucking eat it. Never done me any harm. I've eaten fucking rolls of the stuff over the years. Better than hurting people's feelings, I think. Anyway, I was chatting to this one, and I thought, well, what shall I do about the hair? I thought maybe if I just started, as we chatted, I could just toy with this hair playfully. And I could steadily perhaps just wind it round my finger. And then say, it's a good party, I'm having a really good time, and it's gone, right? <laughs> but it was thick, and I thought, half oh, the fucking fates could come away, right? <laughs> anyway, I was, I was chatting to this woman, everything was going great, and eventually she said, look, Frank, why don't you come back with me? You can stay the night. Now, I was happy about it, but I was also a bit frightened. I'll be honest with you. Because, you know, blokes, they're all this, well, I do this, and I fucking do that. But when it comes down to it, blokes tell more lies about sex than anything else. It's pathetic, right? I'll give you an example. I went out with this girl, typical Birmingham girl, little dab of canal number five behind the ears. <laughs> Christine, her name was, right? 
And we went out on the first day, and she said, look, Frank, I just, want, I just want to make one thing clear. I don't believe in sex before marriage. She said, we can, we can hold hands, we can kiss even, we can go to the cinema, but nothing else. I said, Christine, just being with you is enough. You can boo, but I was young and in love. It was great, right? We used to go out in the moonlight with old hands. It was fantastic, right? But when I saw me mates on the night time, right, it was a different fucking story, right? Because me mates would go, Hey, Frank! And we are fucking that Christine. And we are, and we are fucking her. And we are fucking her. And we are fucking her. And we are fuck, fuck, fuck. And we are fucking her. 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 And they were right next to me. I don't know why they were shouting. <laughs> and of course, what I should have said was, well, actually, Christine's a Catholic, she doesn't believe in sex before marriage. We kiss, we hold hands, you know. We go to the pictures and stuff, but no more than that. Lads. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I should have done, but I fucking didn't. I said, I'm a, I'm a fuck eater, I'm a fuck, smell them. It was wrong. <laughs> it was wrong. I know it was wrong, I regret it now. Once somebody called me bluff, they said, I can't smell anything. I said, oh, don't bother with foreplay. It was pathetic. <laughs> and at the same time, I never laid a hand. I mean, I used to ejaculate, but she knew nothing about it. It was a problem. <laughs> when her boss came in the evening, so did I, right? I'd see her face through the window, I'd ejaculate, right? Not through the window, obviously, but I would, <laughs> would ejaculate. When we were kissing, sometimes she, she would break off and say, can you hear a sort of a gushing noise? <laughs> I used to blame the local factory, it was pathetic, right? And me clothes, they were just fucking... I was the pancake mix man at that time. <laughs> Good night then, Christine. <laughs> I used to wear leg warmers to save the shoes, it was pathetic. <laughs> I just burnt me fucking clothes when I got in the house. Right? Well, not strictly true, I used to send me underpants to a couple I knew in Leicester who couldn't have children of their own. <laughs> and, uh, I am the father of the first ever wash bag baby, in fact. It's, it's all documented. So anyway, I went back this night, and I was with her, and it was great, actually. I must admit, it's one of those rare occasions, I was on a pretty good form, right? Because I can be quite virile at times. True. When I was 15, I once had an erection, right? For three weeks, solid. I say solid, there was a bit of giving it, obviously, but... <laughs> three weeks, right? I remember my mother stood up, and she said, that's the last fucking Grattan's catalogue that comes in this house. <laughs> She said, the piss is ruining that toilet ceiling. <clears throat> Don't explain that. <laughs> now, on this occasion, I was in pretty good form, right? We, we made wonderful love. Three minutes later, we were sitting back having a cigarette. And I thought, I bet that's two of the best shags she's ever had. <laughs> One thing I wouldn't do, and you'll condemn me for this, and quite rightly, I, I am ashamed of the fact I didn't wear a condom. Wrong. I know. I know it's wrong. Even Skippy disapproves by the sounds of it. No, I know it was. I've got this, it's like a psychological problem. I hate that moment after sex when you look down at yourself and there's a pink wrinkled condom just dangling there. It's horrible, isn't it? Especially if you weren't actually wearing one when you put it in. <laughs> it can happen. Those ribbed ones are staying there for weeks, you know. It's like knocking a fucking raw plug in, you got no chance. <laughs> so I didn't use a condom and it was wrong. I know it was wrong. I I'll tell you something, I, I didn't even wash it afterwards. I didn't. You know, usually after sex, you go and nip into the kitchen and. <laughs> you got a dishwasher? <laughs> Just. But it was, one of these, it was one of these shared student house places, and I could hear people cleaning the teeth, and I thought, well, I don't want to be in the sink next to them saying, all right? I'm Frank, by the way. You're going to be long with that toothbrush? They don't like it, do they? Not that there's anything wrong with cleaning your teeth, Mark. Up and down. Very important at your age. I've had more pain with teeth than anything else I can think. I said to my dentist, I said, use your gums. 
Bir şey kalmaz. Aga. Well, I got worried about my dentist. I must be honest, because um, you know, usually when you come out of anaesthetic and they're saying spit it out, but you're saying swallow it, you bastard. I thought, I said, what's going on? What are these footprints on the armrests? I got frightened. Anyway, I didn't wash it this night. I didn't. I went to sleep. It was still glistening. It's true. I'm ashamed, but it's true. I woke up four hours later. I was stuck fast to that bed. I was moored. I was tethered. I went to roll over and the other side of the mattress came up like this and whipped me back into a fucking place. So I thought, well, I had to work my way sort of loose here, right? So I started wriggling about and I woke, woke her up, right? And she said, uh, are you going, Frank? I said, I am going now. I said, but I'd love to see you. Can I see you again tomorrow night? Because it, this has been a fantastic evening for me. She said, well, just a minute. Don't, don't go. Let's have sex just one more time before you leave. And, and I said, well, OK. I said, but we were a bit headstrong before. We got a bit carried away, you know. I said, um, I'd love to have sex. Obviously, who wouldn't? But I'm going to wear this, if that's all right. And she said, um, Well, that's a fitted sheet, isn't it? <laughs> and I never saw her again, which was a, a tragic end to the story. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to leave you now, not, not with a joke, but with, with a piece of advice, right? And I got it from one of these sex manuals, right? You know the sort of thing, I think. I, th I think you're in the one that I've got. What page is it? Oh, that's right, yeah. You were the one on your own. Right. <laughs> Well, I've got this. I've got this out of a sex manual. Try this. Whether you're male or female, this does work. Trust me. The next time you're with your partner, could be tonight, could be fucking years for some people, but write it down. <laughs> Try this. Next time you're with your partner, get your fingers up the bottom, right? <laughs> yes, they do go, Ooh, but never mind. Get up there. I don't know if it turns them on, but you never get asked to make breakfast the next morning. I think that's important. <laughs> You've been a great audience. Thanks a lot. Good night. Well, oh, you spoil me. Last time I did an encore, it was a fucking trap. I'll tell you, I was, I read this thing in the paper the other day, right? They're going to bring back Doctor Who. Did you read this? And they're going to bring it back. And they said they're going to put a bit more sex into it to make it a bit more exciting, right? Now, I always thought there was a fair bit of sex in Doctor Who already, right? I have fancied every assistant that Doctor Who has ever had, right? I would fuck K... I'd fuck K9. I'd fuck K9. Couple of points, maybe, but I would. Bonnie Langford... I don't know. I've got this problem with Bonnie Langford. I'm sure she's a very nice person, but I can't help looking at her face without expecting monkey shit to come out of it. No disrespect to her as a person, obviously. Now... They do say, now, I, I don't know if this is true, they do say these Doctor Who girls, they're a lot bigger when you get inside. Now, it might not be true. <laughs> oh, a boo from over there. Identify yourself. You disgusting, sexist pig. Thanks. Man with a beard as well, which is... Uh... <laughs> well, you would be upset. You turned up looking for a folk club tonight, and uh, you got this. Surely you mean to say, you disgusting sexist pig, with a hey no, nonny no, 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 no. <laughs> if they're going to bring sex into Doctor Who, does this mean we're going to see the Daleks having it off? Because have you noticed, you never see any little Daleks about it. It's weird, isn't it, that? I suppose it's because they've got those rubber things on the end that never... <laughs> but I would love to see a Dalek coming in a bit pissed on the night time, eh? All out, the, the eye going all over the fucking place. <laughs> Trying to get up the step. <laughs> I'm getting in the house. And the female Dalek being there saying, Hello, darling. <laughs> and him saying, Do you fancy a quick one? <laughs> Give it to me, big boy. 
and then there'd be a horrible clanking of metal and blue sparks flying all over the place, and he'd be going, ejaculate, ejaculate, it'd be worth seeing. <laughs> and does it mean that Dr. Who is going to start shagging? Because he'll be absolutely crap, right? He's about 4,000 years old for a start off. And also, when he gets to the good bit, right, when he's on the vinegar strokes, he'll be going, uh, he'll be going, oh, 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 uh, 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 disappear. And there'll be some woman lying there saying, typical fucking time, Lord. Half a dozen thrusts, then off to another galaxy. They're all the same, aren't they? Even Superman, they say, he's going to start having sex in the comics now, right? What, what's going to happen, right, is him and Lois Lane are going to get together, they're going to have babies, it'll be nice, right? Now, I don't know if you've seen, have you seen Superman 1, Mark? Now, he's already had a bit of a dip in that one. But do you know, in Super, do you know that Marlon Brando got a million dollars for a day shooting in Superman 1? <laughs> million dollars for a day shooting? It's not what his fucking son got, is it? <laughs> But Superman has got a gift that I think... Sort yourselves out. He's got a gift that we've all dreamt of. X-ray vision, eh? This bloke's been wishing he had it ever since I've been on stage. I'm right, Anna. Yes. So Superman, he could get in the evening and say, uh, Hey, Lois, let's make love. And Lois could say, Well, hold on a minute, Superman. You better wear something first. And he could say, no need, Lois, because doing, oing, 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 x-ray vision. Bit of theatre, I thought I'd throw it in tonight. Doing, oing, no need, because your ovum hasn't reached the fertilisation area yet. <laughs> you gonna have that shit now, or wait till later on? It would be a... It would be a hell of a party piece, wouldn't it? Anyway, I was gonna play you a song from my new album tonight. Uh, I only bought it yesterday, and it's alright, but I am gonna go now. You've been a great audience, thanks a lot. Cheers, Good night. Yeah.